shall we begin? of everything you've done for them. Eventually they will hate you. Greetings, sentients. Today we're here to talk about 2001's Transformers Robots in Disguise, Episode 1, Battle Protocol. Now this episode is written by Tom Weiner, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that name. Now one of the things you need to keep in mind is that Autobots and Optimus Prime haven't been aired since the 80s. We did have, of course, Beast Wars and Beast Machines, but these featured brand new characters, the Maximals, led by Optimus Primal. So for a lot of people, this was the first real introduction to Autobots and to Optimus Prime. For myself, I had seen a couple of the episodes from the series in the 80s, but I didn't really remember them beyond just a couple of images. I knew who Optimus Prime was and Megatron, Starscream, and you know, the, the the popular legacy type characters. I had seen the original movie as well. That one I did remember much better. But that was about all that I knew, aside from maybe a couple of books my mother had once brought home from the library. So for me, this was really my first modern introduction to Autobots in general, and of course even Optimus Prime in particular. <laughs> Oh man, I'm late! I can't believe it! Why does that always happen? Now the episode begins with us being introduced to Koji, who is going to be the main human character of the series. Now Robots in Disguise also kind of kicked off the cycle of having the useless human sidekick for the Autobots. Now human characters aren't unknown in Transformers. The original series had uh, Spark, Plug, and Spike as two human mechanics that would often aid the Autobots in their adventures and their interactions with, you know, humanity. And later on, they would also have Daniel. But Beast Wars and Beast Machines didn't really have human characters. Um, briefly, Beast Wars had uh, some, but only very briefly. Now, I don't know how typical this is in the Japanese Transformer shows. As I said, I haven't really seen many of their exclusives. I do not believe that their Beast War series had human characters, but I'm not sure about their earlier ones, such as the Godmasters, Victory Zone, and the like, if they had major human characters or not. I do know that some of their series actually feature Autobots and Decepticons, per se, but actually humans that could essentially turn into Autobots and Decepticons, as the way the Headmasters and power master concept worked differently in Japan, but that's for another time. Anyway, for Robots in Disguise, we began the concept or the theme of introducing a human character to be the audience surrogate into the world of the Transformers, and perhaps to kind of ground a story about alien robots who are fighting their own war that doesn't directly really have anything to do with Earth and humans other than they happen to be fighting their war here now. Unfortunately, very little effort tends to be taken to either A, make these human characters interesting, or even remotely realistic personality-wise, and B, have anything to actually do with the plot. Mostly they're there to, at best, stand around and watch, with the odd comet thrown in, or at worst, 
do something really stupid and need to be rescued. Filling in that role for Robots in Disguise will be Koji. There's really not a lot to be said about Koji. He's not given too much of a personality, um, other than that he's just young, eager, and honest, I guess. One or two episodes do at least make him the focus, but generally speaking, he often barely will pop up. As, like I said, he doesn't really have anything to do with the plot. Nevertheless, he does at least have a connection to what's going on, which is more than can often be said by a lot of other human characters that actually have no reason whatsoever to be involved. Koji actually does have a reason, and that is because of his father, Dr. Onishi, who will be introduced in a moment. Now, there is a quick little Easter egg thrown in here. The clock on Koji's bedstand is actually a reference to Beast Wars Neo. One of the interesting things that was only rarely done with the beast former transformers is mythical animals most transformers will turn into actual real life animals gorillas rhinos even dinosaurs or whatever but you know creatures that actually existed on very rare occasions hasbro and takara played around with the concept of a transformer turning into a mythical creature such as a dragon or a unicorn the clock is in the image of a japanese mythical creature i don't know the correct pronunciation of it in Japanese, but it's often translated as raccoon dog into English. That's more of an approximation of kind of what it looks like, per se, I think, than a literal translation of the name, but I could be mistaken. Perhaps it does mean raccoon dog. Anyway, one of the Maximals in Beast Wars Neo transformed into this mythical creature. Now, to us, it mostly just looks like a raccoon. But in Japanese lore, it's actually a supernatural creature. I don't know too much about any of the myths associated with it. I believe it is known for getting drunk, hence why it has a little bottle of sake with it. Which, again, the toy for the Beast War Neo character actually came with. I don't know if they're actually associated with time, I don't believe they are, but again, I could be mistaken. However, the Beast War Neo character, in fact, was, as this toy actually doubled as a real-life clock. You could actually buy the toy, and it would actually keep time, as long as you had the battery installed. I actually have looked to trying to get this myself once or twice, but in addition to being very rare, it's also very expensive. Now, I want to show you this quick scene. I have, these are not still frames. One of the things about Robots in Disguise, in order to save on animation, they rather cheaply will often just have these frozen scenes that are meant to convey a lot of activity is going on here in the background, such as people marching or running away or celebrating or parades or whatever. On the first viewing of this, it is a little bit of a shock. As I said, my first Transformers show that I actually watched and remembered was Beast Wars, then followed by Beast Machine, where all the scenes are animated. So the cheapness of simply showing up a frozen scene and having noise background noise. It was a bit jarring. Um, I'm not a huge purveyor of anime, so I don't know how common this is. Um, I have seen it in other places, but I've also seen anime that never uses this technique. And I have seen it outside of anime. There are indeed American cartoons that sometimes do things similar. Personally, I find this very annoying. If you're not going to animate the scene, then don't show it. This is Dory Dutton reporting from the first International Scientific Symposium, a truly groundbreaking event. Now, Dory here is actually a minor recurring character. I don't believe she ever plays any important parts or roles whatsoever, and it mainly just is a cameo type character. But anytime Robots in Disguise needs a reporter character, it is usually this purple haired woman. Scientists from all over the globe, specialists in the fields of energy and the environment, are meeting here today to share their research and work together for the betterment of all humankind. Yes, never mind what countries they come from, or how aggressive they may be, how they may mistreat or marginalize women, or people of a certain minority or orientation or religions. Let's just ignore all that. The first speaker will be Dr. Onishi, the world's foremost archaeologist and expert on energy and natural resources. All right, Dad! He's about to start! Hurry up! Now, here we meet Dr. Onishi. This is Koji's father, and unlike most human characters and 
most of the Transformers shows that would be following this, or of this era, he actually is an important character to the plot. Or he will be about halfway through the series. Um, he has the interesting dual expertise in archaeology and energy. I'm not really sure how these two fields of study are related, but in Transformers, there actually is quite a lot of ancient technology lying around on Earth that does give off powerful energy. Some of it explained, a lot of it not explained. I suppose Dr. Unishi could actually be technically an expert in this sort of ancient energy-given technology, hence his odd dual masteries in archaeology and energy. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you. We're here from around the globe to share in a unique and historical event. Right now, the greatest danger to the planet Earth is the inefficient and improper use of energy. Yes, the greatest danger to Earth is the improper and inefficient use of energy. Not terrorism, not nuclear war, not World War III, not any sort of oppressive government or censorships or law. No, it's the inefficient use of energy. You did not use that battery to this last drop of energy. You are contributing to the greatest threat against humanity. Now, this is the series' introduction to Megatron, the very first time that we've seen this character. And again, yes, it can be a little bit confusing. The leader of the bad guy faction in Transformers is often called Megatron, but it isn't always still the same character, of course. In the 80s, the original leader of the Decepticons was indeed called Megatron, who later during the movie was upgraded or reformatted, I should say, into Galvatron. Later in Beast Wars, one of the Predacons would take the name Megatron for himself, as he would attempt to take over Cybertron. It is a little confusing to have two characters with the same name, but keep in mind the original Megatron at this point goes by the name Galvatron, assuming he's even still around at all during the Beast War era. This is the Robots in Disguise Megatron. He is therefore the third character to bear this name, and is of no relation to the previous two. It is worth pointing out that in Japan, he actually does not have the same name as Megatron. I believe this character is referred to as Gigatron, and he is of no connection to Megatron, or the previous Megatrons whatsoever, of course. Now, yes, you may have noticed that he is in the form of a giant hand. This is not an animation error. Megatron actually does change into a giant purple and black hand. To clear up any confusion, Megatron is in fact a relatively rare type of Transformer, colloquially known as a Six Changer. Yes, that is a Transformer with six different distinct modes. These really aren't that common, mostly because it's quite hard to engineer a toy with six different distinct modes. Uh, usually there is a little bit of overlap and you'll have some semi-useless modes. In this case, uh, we will see several of Megatron's modes in this episode, but not all of them. Megatron terrorized! Now this is an interesting little point to show out. In the original series, Autobots and Decepticons and the like would simply transform, you know, whenever they felt like it or the need arose, with very little fanfare usually. Beast Wars introduced the concept of a command code. This is when the Transformer would shout out his command code to initiate transformation. Maximals and Predacons each had their own type of command code. A Maximal would shout Maximize to transform into his robot mode, and a Predacon would shout terrorize. To go back to their beast modes, both factions would simply say beast mode. Now occasionally characters would transform without saying anything, but normally they would shout out their command code. Beast machines um, skewed at this a little bit. Um, Maximals, because they were techno-organic, that is half machine, half organic, kind of like a cyborg, no longer had command code, but instead kind of had to enter a meditative state in order to transform. And so instead would repeat a mantra 
I am transformed to initiate their robot mode. There was no need to do anything for going into beast mode because if they lost focus, they simply automatically shifted back to beast mode. Uh, apparently a bit of a reverse, beast mode are their default state rather than their, them actually being robots in disguise. For the Viacons, Megatron never used command codes. However, his Viacon generals occasionally would, and each of them had a personalized command code. Uh, Tankor would shout Pulverize, Jetstorm would shout Afterburn, and Thrust would shout Overdrive. This was really only done for the first season of Beast Machines, however. In the second season, the surviving Viacon generals didn't tend to use a command code at all, and the new generals introduced afterwards, Obsidian and Stryka, don't believe ever did use command codes. Although, in their first episode, they did run around shouting phrases, which could be assumed to be their command codes if they had them, as at the point they were pretending to be um, very unintelligent. So robots in disguise went to using the Beast War style command codes, and we'll see the Autobot one in a minute, but the Predacons do all shout terrorize. Unfortunately, I don't know if this is true for the Japanese version and is just part of this translation or if it is a literal translation, but the characters do seem to have trouble understanding what command code often goes with what mode. A Predacon should only shout terrorize if he's transforming into robot mode, but uh, if you watch the series, you'll note that sometimes they'll shout terrorize to transform into anything. Now, admittedly, with Megatron, having six different modes technically means he needs six different command codes to transform into his six different form. Uh, we'll quickly see that Megatron typically only uses Terrorize and then will transform into a random mode, although he occasionally will shout a different command code. I am Megatron! Huh? I am the leader of the Predacons and the future ruler of this galaxy. The Predacons are in need of energy, and there is one among you who knows the location of every energy source on Earth. You, Dr. Onishi! In the transmissions we intercepted, you were described as Earth's foremost expert. You won't learn a thing. Not from me. I do like how Megatron says transmissions we intercepted. He's actually referring to the news broadcast uh, done from, by Dory earlier, which is just, of course, a general broadcasted television transmission. But the Predacons, being militaristic conquerors, viewed, of course, as it must be some type of top-secret transmissions uh, between the humans, and they've managed to intercept and decode them. It's a nice little bit of character, and something, unfortunately, wrote in disguise doesn't do a whole lot of. <laughs> Answer it, Dad! Answer it! Koji, listen closely! You've got to... Dad? <laughs> My dad's in danger. Somebody's gotta help him! And somebody will. I'll do everything I can to help your father. Now, going back with what I said earlier, you do have to remember that this is most people's first modern introduction to Optimus Prime. Granted, this isn't THE Optimus Prime, but A Optimus Prime of the Robots in Disguise universe, their equivalent of him. But still, for a lot of people, this was their first modern introduction to the character. And I have to say, I really like this introduction. Uh, it's not quite as dramatic, perhaps, as it could have been, but it stands out. I do really like how they have Koji having very understandable sense of despair here, having just witnessed on TV his father being confronted by a giant three-story or whatever tall robot, and then having no idea now what's happened to his father. Optimus Prime literally comes almost out of nowhere, like an answer to a prayer. And this is something that has always stuck with me. Um, as I said, I was familiar with the character of the original Optimus Prime, but really beyond being kind of aware of him and thinking that he was a pretty epic looking character, I didn't really have too much solid memories of him or anything anything really about him. So this, in a lot of ways, even for me, was kind of the first time I really got introduced to him. And this introduction has always stuck with me. I really like it. <laughs> Unit 6 to base. The fire's under control. Please step huh? away from the truck. Uh, I heard a voice, but there's no one there. It's an emergency. I'm going to need to borrow your truck for a while. Please step huh? back. Yeah, sure. The truck will be returned to the station as soon as my mission is completed. Thanks for your cooperation. Now here's where the Robots in Disguise title gets its justification, if you will. The humans 
as I said in a previous episode, have no idea the Autobots exist. Again, you have to remember, Robots in Disguise takes place in its own separate universe. Therefore, the Autobot Decepticon conflict that happened in the 80s show has not taken place on this Earth. They don't know anything about Cybertron, Transformers, Optimus, nothing. And so if the Autobots had been here for an indistinguishable amount of time, pretending to be regular cars. Optimus Prime is a fire engine that is part of the city's fire station. We're never given a specific name or number for the station, but um, he's just pretended to be a fire engine this entire time, and only now that Megatron has shown up, now he's got other duties and tending to this local fire. Where is this guy? Got to hurry. Now, we're never really properly introduced to Koji's mother. Uh, she was there in the background in some of the earlier scenes where we were introduced to Koji, but apparently she's never taught him not to meet up with strangers in the middle of the night. Take it easy, Koji. Huh? I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Optimus Prime. I'm an Autobot from the planet Cybertron. A robot from another planet? That's right. Now we've got no time to lose. We've got to get to your father as quickly as possible. Now, similar with Megatron, it's worth pointing out in the Japanese version, this is not Optimus Prime. Again, keep in mind, of course, they do give him a different name in Japan. Optimus Prime is known as Convoy, but this isn't Convoy either. This, in fact, is a completely unrelated separate character called Fire Convoy, who just happens to have a similar name and look to Convoy, or as he is better known, Optimus Prime. The symposium's in New York. You can't drive across the Atlantic ocean anything is possible koji never forget that what you are about to see cannot be shared with anyone it's a dead end what are you doing This is the Global Space Bridge. It uses transwarp technology to get us any place on Earth in a matter of minutes. I hope you're right, because right now it looks like we're headed straight into the ocean! Bridge uses an auto sensor interlink, which opens the portals we need and closes the ones we've just passed through. It keeps track of our location anywhere on the planet. Now, let's go rescue your father. Now here we're introduced to the Global Space Bridge. This is kind of a combination of two different concepts. The Space Bridge from the original series in the 80s and Transwarp from Beast Wars. Both of these involve a sort of, well, typically faster than light kind of travel. The Space Bridge is essentially a wormhole, not unlike a Stargate, if you've ever watched or seen the Stargate movies or TV series. And Transwarp is not unlike the warp drive of Star Trek with time travel thrown in. The Global Space Bridge basically takes these two names and mashes them together uh, to create their own form of fast transit. I don't think it really has anything to do with either of them. Again, kind of a little Easter egg-ish sort of thing. If you're familiar with either of those two shows, you'll recognize these terms, and you'll at least have a general concept of what the Space Bridge is meant to do. The Global Space Bridge is the Autobots' way of getting around. It can take them to literally almost any part on Earth, or at least anywhere on the land. Um, I'm not sure if it's really just a ton network or if there is some type of speed boost that happens when they're inside. It's not instantaneous travel, but it does tend to take them only a short time to go anywhere. I also don't quite understand how it's supposed to be a secret. Uh, you will note that Optimus tells Koji he can't tell anyone about this, yet literally if anybody is watching they can see road pieces coming up out of the ground, the water opening up, ramps being deployed. It seems like this would be a really hard thing to keep a secret. Uh, granted that this 
scene is at least taking place at night, but there will be plenty of episodes where it takes place in the broad daylight with plenty of other people around. And yet somehow the global space bridge is still supposed to be a secret. One also has to wonder how the Autobot keep humans from stumbling across it anyway. I mean, what if a developer came along and decided to build some houses or beach homes along this coast? <laughs> or the highway department decided to extend the road? Wouldn't they stumble across the Autobot space bridge entrance here? With that at least some type of coordination with the authorities, you would think that you could not keep this a secret. Uh, yet, from all appearances, the Autobots do not coordinate with any human agency or government. I am Megatron, the ruler of many worlds. You dare to defy me? You monster. I will never betray planet Earth. No. Perhaps a demonstration. Megatron, terrorize! So like I was mentioning earlier, uh, Megatron is a six changer with six different modes. Here we see his third mode. We've seen his giant hand mode. Yes, he really does turn into that. His robot mode. And here is sort of an intermediate mode. This is not actually his beast mode, despite its bestial appearance. Uh, this mode doesn't even really have an official name that I'm aware of. It's typically referred to either as bat mode or gargoyle mode. And it's a mode that Megatron does actually see seem inordinately fond of, although for the most part doesn't really seem to serve much of a purpose. Um, there's not really anything this mode does that he can't do in any of his other modes. One of the inherent problems in a lot of six changers, now that there are a lot of them, is again, oftentimes you'll have redundant modes. Uh, arguably, he is smaller in this form. I actually found as a kid it was easiest to store him in this form. When I put him away in a box, I would fold him up into bat mode, as I usually thought of it, because he took less room this way. Uh, arguably, he's a smaller target this way, and he's obviously capable of flight, although Megatron can actually fly in most of his modes, and Megatron will occasionally retreat in this form. Uh, that does seem to be the two usual purposes that he will use this mode for, um, either to run away or to threaten, as the jaws in the front of him perhaps makes them look more intimidating, or at least Megatron thinks they do. Uh, you'll also note the use of the command code terrorize to transform into what is essentially a sort of pseudo beast mode. Uh, like I said, Megatron didn't really tend to have distinct separate command codes for his six different modes and would often use other command codes or the same command code uh, to turning into alternate forms. It is worth pointing out one of the differences between the Japanese and American versions of this episode. Um, in Japan, Megatron seems to bizarrely suffer from split personality disorder of some kind. Literally, he has a different personality for each of his six forms. Uh, now, I haven't actually really watched the Japanese version, so I'm not quite sure how different the personalities are, if he's a completely different character, or if it's simply different attributes are, you know, enhanced or, you know, or regressed or whatever. But I believe they even use a different voice for each of his six modes as well. In the American version, they wisely did not include this feature, as none of the other Transformers, regardless of how many modes they have, have different personalities in their different form. And this is not a thing going back to other earlier Transformer uh, TV series either. Beast Machines, Beast Wars, uh, the original series, and I don't even think the other Japanese TV shows have done this either, with their, you know, their Headmaster series, or, or, you know, Victory Zone whatever, and their Beast War series. I think this, I could be wrong, but I think this is a unique feature of Megatron, without any explanation or plot relevance. Events. It's just a bizarre tick that he has in the Japanese version. But in the American version, he's always the same person, always the same personality, always the same voice, regardless of what mode he's in. And as I said, considering how irrelevant his multiple personality dis disorder is, I think that was the wiser choice of him to take. <laughs> Think that a puny fire engine is going to stop me? <laughs> Optimus Prime, transform! All right, now Optimus Prime has arrived, and uh, you'll note two things. Uh, first, the front half of the fire engine disconnects from the back half, and is not a complete vehicle in its own right, but it's the only part that transforms into the robot mode. We'll talk more about this later, but this is one of the gripes people had with this version of Optimus Prime. Second, we are introduced to the Autobot command code, which goes with the very generic transform. Uh, I suppose this is slightly similar to the Beast Wars man, uh, Beast Machine, sorry, man 
mantra of I am transformed, but it's very generic. And in fact, robots in disguise will use this very generically. The Decepticons, when they do get introduced, also use the exact same command code. Well, look who's here. Optimus Prime as I live and breathe. Now, I know that's just a phrase, but does Megatron breathe? I mean, as a Predacon, he does actually have organic components. It is entirely possible that perhaps he does breathe. It's a minor quibble, I know, but one of the signs of good writing is to remember who and what your characters are. If Megatron is a robot and doesn't breathe, why would he use this saying? I know it's a common human saying, but Megatron's an alien. Why would he use common human phrases that don't really apply to him? They both changed their form. Autobots are just like the Predacon. And here we get introduced to the subplot of this episode. Will Koji trust Optimus Prime? Yes, that's an actual theme now. Koji is going to spend most of the rest of the episode wrestling whether or not he can trust Optimus Prime. Because Optimus transforms just like Megatron. Which, you know, totally makes them the same. Cut Now here we come into one of the little idiosyncrasies that anime had, at least Sarah, the early 2000s. Um, for more modern anime that I've been watching, this no longer seems to be the case, or perhaps it's just translated differently now. But there used to be a standard staple of anime that in combat, characters would shout out what weapon they're using. It wasn't necessarily 100% of the time, but it tends to certainly be the majority of the time. And my understanding, again, I'm no expert on Japanese culture, but my understanding is that, again, at least during the early 2000s period, Japan as a culture, a society, had a sort of hyper-focus on good manners, on being polite, proper etiquette. Their language actually is structured th this way. There are certain phrases or names or terms of endearment or titles that are given to people based on your relationship with them. Whether a familiar relationship or a friendship or professional, educational, there's like a little name to be attached to everything. Because this is seen as being polite. This has actually contributed to Japan's historical isolationist um, attitude that, by large, they don't follow anymore. But certainly, once upon a time, Japan viewed themselves as quite, or the people of Japan viewed themselves as quite superior to the gaijins, or the outsiders. And part of that reason was that these foreigners were not nearly as polite as the Japanese people. And it was, was a source of tension for many years historically between Japan and other countries. So I'm told that this sort of hyper-focus on proper etiquette ended up translating itself into early anime, and that characters would politely inform each other when they were about to attack and with what weapon. Now, I don't know exactly how true this is. Maybe it has nothing to do with this, and pe simply the people who made anime just thought it was really cool. But it's a common and quite irritating trope to have characters constantly shout out what weapon they are using right before they use it. And then very often missing. Again, this is another common trope, not native to just anime. You'll find it, in fact, in lots of genres and from lots of countries, whether action, real life, or cartoons, uh, where characters will open fire and just shoot at the other characters, uh, at the ground, at the other characters' feet. This, unfortunately, is... Also true in Robots in Disguise. You're hopelessly outmatched! Come forth, Predacons, and destroy Optimus Prime! Bring it on! Now here is Megatron's proper beast mode, and the fourth mode we've seen him turn into this episode. Megatron transforms into a two-headed dragon. Yes, actually, as a kid, I thought this was actually pretty dang cool beast mode. And you will note that Megatron did not say beast mode to turn into it, but in fact gave his robot activation code. I know it's a little ped pedantic to keep harping on it, but this really did bother me as a kid when watching it. And 
as an adult, I still find this very lazy writing. Didn't anyone overview the episode after making it to be sure little errors like this didn't happen? They seem fairly obvious. Although, again, like I said, Megatron being a six-changer has lots of modes to keep track of, and they don't appear to have bothered to even come up with six different command codes. Regardless, this is his primary beast mode, and like I said, it's actually pretty cool. Now, he's far from the first dragon in the Transformer franchise. Um, even the original series in the 80s did have dragons in it, such as the Terracons or Monsterbots. Of course, these were completely purely mechanical dragons. Beast Wars gave us our first organic dragon, or technically a transmetal dragon. Um, in the third season, the Predacon Megatron became a dragon. For some reason, the toy was sold as a transmetal 2, which is actually a different type of technology in Beast Wars, and you'll find often many people will make the error by referring to Megatron's dragon mode as a transmetal 2, but it was actually, in fact, just a transmetal. Beast Machines, for the first season, Megatron is still in his dragon form. And then the second season, we're introduced to Savage, yet another dragon. So, the Roads in the Skies Megatron's hardly unique in this form. He's not even unique as the first two-headed dragon. However, for me, he was the first two-headed dragon in Transformers that I encountered. The Predacon Megatron, both in Beast Wars and in Beast Machines, along with Savage, only have one head each. But Robots in Disguise Megatron has two of them. Slapper! Terrorize! <laughs> Dash jump! Terrorize! Dark scream! Terrorize! What do you know? Somebody must have forgotten to lock the gate at the petting zoo. Come the repaints. Yes, here we're introduced to the Predacons. Um, this is actually most of them right here. There is only one other Predacon in Robots in Disguise, so they're quite a small band for the future ruler of the galaxy to have under his command. But he did claim to be the ruler of many worlds, so perhaps there are Predacon occupational forces on those planets, and Megatron's actually running on a skeleton crew. I don't know. Regardless, here we're also introduced to another running theme of Robots in Disguise, or at least a toy line. Most Transformers shows and their associated toy lines will create all new toys for the toy line. Robots in Disguise, however, tended to do this half and half. Half of the cast are new toys. The other half are actually repaints of previous toy lines. Now, this isn't entirely unknown. Transformers has actually, even since the beginning, done repaints of other toy lines. You do have to remember that much of the original Transformers actually were separate toy line. Diaclone and Microman and, and a couple other minor lines uh, were taken, repainted, renamed, and became the Transformers. Later on in Transformers, they would introduce completely new toy lines, such as Generation 2, that actually, along with introducing new toys, got some of the original toys and repainted them, selling them as part of the new Generation 2 toy line, which was a disastrous failure. Machine Wars that followed afterwards was actually also largely repaints of Generation 2 toys and included some unreleased toys. Beast Wars, however, was all new toys. Again, as you may remember from a previous, a previous episode, Beast Wars was a brand new concept of organic beast modes instead of mechanical ones. So you couldn't use any of the old style toys. On top of that, Kenner, which was the company in charge of the Beast War toy line, really totally renovated Transformers by turning the robots into proper action figures having things like ball joints and a lot more articulation. Previously, a lot of Transformers were, as they referred to as, bricks. That is, they had no articulation, you, or very little. You transformed them to robot mode, and you basically had a figurine or a statue. Beast War toys were action figures. So they were all new because of this. And this carried over even onto subsequent waves when they introduced the Transmetals and the Fusors and then the Transmetal 2s. These were all new toys. They were not previous toys taken and repainted. Now, Beast Wars did have a few repaints. 
uh, within it. As you can even see in the show, Cheetor and Tigertron characters, for example, are just recolored versions of each other. But for the most part, it was all brand new. Beast Machines followed suit with this. The Technorganic style was really unique, so they really couldn't repaint any Beast War toys. So they're almost all completely new, with I think only one exception. Uh, the Viacons are the same. These are alien, Cybertronian, pilotless vehicles. Not something that was done in the original series. Or any of the you know, other toy lines before. So they had to be all new models as well. And again, of course, they have the action figure level of articulation. Now, there was a subline in Beast Machines called the Dinobots, named after the original Dinobots. Which was nothing but repaints and... Thematically doesn't quite visually fit into the other Beast Machines, although I quite liked the toys. Like I said, especially since I became familiar with Transformers starting with Beast Wars, it very much stood out to me that essentially half of the Robots in Disguise line are repaints. In fact, all three of these Predacons are repaints of Transmetal 2 Beast War toys. Now, Megatron is not. He is indeed a brand new toy. As I previously mentioned, the Beast War Megatron as a dragon only had one head. Whereas this Megatron has two, so clearly they're not the same toy. The Autobots that appear in this episode, in fact, most of the Autobots are all brand new toys. Um, that did seem to kind of be where they split the line. The Autobots are new models and the bad guys are old models. Don't know if that was deliberate or it just worked out that way. And as I said, there is some overlap. One or you know, two of the Autobots are repaints, and one or two of the bad guys are new toys. So for here, we have Slapper, who is a repaint of Spitter, a Predacon from Beast Wars. Gas Skunk, who is a repaint, barely, of Stink Bomb, a Maximal from Beast Wars. And Dark Scream a repaint of the Night Glider, another Maximal from Beast Wars. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, Japan doesn't really seem to follow a clear concept of alt modes being grouped by faction. As I also mentioned previously, the original series didn't necessarily always follow it that closely either. But in Beast Wars, Maximals were mammals, along occasionally with the odd bird or fish. Predacons were reptiles, insects, arachnids, amphibians, crustaceans, pretty much anything that wasn't a mammal or bird and fish. Robots in Disguise has no theme with its animals. Predacons turn into animals. If you are an animal, you are a Predacon. There's not really anything beyond that. There's not really any explanation for why they are cyborg animals. Again, in Beast Wars, that is what Transmetal 2s were, cyborg animals. In Robots in Disguise, Predacons just are cyborg animals. There's no explanation from it. I don't know how this connects with the idea of being a robot in disguise. I mean, who's going to be fooled by a giant truck-sized cyborg frog? But there you go. On top of that, Megatron isn't even an actual animal, but a mythical dragon. And not even a particularly organic one looking at that. I'm not quite sure of the style that Megatron is supposed to be. He's not quite the mechanical look of the 80s. Um, there's definitely a sort of biomechanical feel to him. He's got kind of some more organic-ish style curves. But he's still at the same time very clearly mechanical. And not really in the cyborg style that the other Predacons are in. It's just one of those things that you know, repaints... Uh, will suffer from because they were made with a different style in mind and it's up to the series that's going to use them to try to explain this or not explain it in the case of Robots in the Skies which just simply ignores it. I knew we'd get rid of you someday Optimus and today is the day. Now this is a little bit of an interesting exchange right here. The Predacons expect express familiarity with Optimus, as if they've met him before. This is never expanded upon. I don't believe it's ever made any reference to in any of the other episodes. Uh, if these Predacons have encountered Optimus Prime before, we're never given any backstory. As I said, Megatron does describe himself the ruler of many worlds. It does make one curious if Optimus has fought them on some of these worlds, and if Megatron still is the ruler, 
has he failed to save some of these other worlds? We don't know, and we'll probably never know. It certainly would have been interesting had they done a little bit more with this. Um, this would have been an excellent opportunity to make the Predacons seem a lot more threatening. On the other hand, this is a TV show for young kids. As I said, Hasbro tends to make their show geared towards teenagers or young adults. Takara tends to skew their shows towards kindergarten or younger. And probably making the Predacon scary was not on their list of things to do. Right, Razor! Center Laser! Left Laser! Now this is an interesting little uh, carryover, if you're at all interested in the toy line at least. One of the gimmicks of the Transmetal 2 line in Beast Wars was the introduction of the Spark Crystal, which is actually a neat concept that I wish Hasbro and Takara still did today. Um, rather than simply painting a symbol somewhere on the Transformer's body, there instead is this little half orb, color-coded to the faction, pink for Predacon and green for Maximal. Unless it's Beast Wars Neo, in which case it's red for Maximal. No idea why. Beast Machines also used this feature, but randomized the colors. Maximals and Viacons, including v Viacon drones, which don't have spark crystals, all have a random color. But it's not really the color that tells you the faction, but... Inside each of the orbs is, in fact, the symbol of the team they belong to, either Predacon or Maximal or Viacon. As Beast War repaints, these Predacons still have these Spark Crystals. Uh, but interesting, Roads and Skies is also where they stopped using Spark Crystals. The Autobot toys don't have them. I suppose this makes sense because, as I said before, there are a lot of repaints in the toy line, and all of the vehicle repaints unless they repaint a Viacon, aren't going to have spark crystals. So perhaps to make some sort of uniformity among your vehicle transformers is to simply not include spark crystals in any of them. Interestingly enough, Megatron, who, as, as I said, was a brand new toy, I believe I don't believe he is from any other Japanese toy line. I could be mistaken about that. But I believe he was brand new for Oats in the Skies. Either way, though, he actually does come with a spark crystal as well. However, given that sparks, which... By the way, if you don't know what a spark is, the concept was introduced in Beast Wars, and it's a Transformer's life force. It's how they determine if a Transformer gets blown up, whether or not he can be repaired. Again, remember, they're robots, not organic people. You can cut them up, blow them apart, bash them in, and do all kinds of unpleasant things, and then simply repair them afterwards, as you could repair a car. Because after all, they're machines. Yet sometimes when a Transformer is blown up, they don't put him back together, and instead the character dies. And why this would happen in the original series, there wasn't really an explanation for when a Transformer was repairable and when he wasn't. They would simply throw in a line like, the damage is too severe, without really an explanation of exactly what that means, what determines what is too damaging and what is not. Beast Wars explained this by there being a sort of energized orb located in a Transformer's body their spark, as it was called. If the spark is extinguished, then the Transformer is dead. As long as the spark endures, however, then they can be repaired, or even transferred into a brand new body, which also happened on occasion. Sparks, however, cannot survive for extended periods outside of a body. It's not an immediate death sentence, but they will expire if they are not within a some sort of containment, usually a body, but it can also be other special equipment designed to hold a spark that's not a proper body or anything, but just a container. For Robots in Disguise, why I bring this up is that each, of course, of the Predacons, including Megatron, toys had a purple orb with the Predacon logo on it on the toy. The show uses these not as their life force, but as a weapon. That's right, the three Predacons have just fired their spark crystals, technically, at Optimus Prime. Although, again, in the show, these are simply laser cannons, I guess. Megatron actually will use it as well. I might need a little help on this one. Tie Battle Protocol! Battle Protocol activating now! Now, here we get introduced to Ty, the Autobot apparently sentient computer. She's a bit of an interesting character, as she's actually the only, or well, the nearest, to being the only female Cybertronian in the series. Robots in Disguise is a bit unique. Again, 
in more ways than one, but one of those ways is that there are no female Transformers in it. It's uh, that I'm aware of the only version of Transformers that doesn't have female Transformers. The original series had at least one episode featuring them, and then R.C. became a main character during the movie and the following seasons. Beast Wars had uh, two main female characters, Air Razor and Black Arachnia, and Transmutate was a one-shot character and has also been kind of posthumously identified as female. Beast Machines actually added two more female Transformers with both Botanica and Stryka. For the most part, never been large in numbers. There's usually always been at least one or two female Transformers uh, somewhere in uh, any, any Transformer TV show. But Robots in Disguise does not have any. Uh, there's no explanation uh, one way or the other about this. It's just never addressed. So Ty is the closest we come to that. For some reason, her avatar takes the form of a holographic human girl. Why a alien computer from a planet of robots takes a human form is not clear. Uh, as in so many things, Robots in Disguise never talks about it, never explains it, and nobody questions it. Perhaps this is a standard sort of thing whenever on an alien world the holographic avatar just always assumes the image of the dominant sentient species of the planet. You could assume perhaps it, you know, helps with interactions, except that, as I said before, the Autobots don't really interact with humans. They have no connection to any human agency, government, corporation, or anything. Uh, outside of really Koji, and later Dr. Onishi, they don't interact with humans on a regular basis. Why does she have human form? Uh, even if you argue it's for Koji's sake, she's not been introduced to Koji yet. Uh, this is actually the Autobot headquarters that her hologram is materializing in. It's a completely separate location, uh, and she and Koji have not yet interacted, nor will they, in fact, in this episode, but we can see that she already has human form. I need backup in Alpha Quadrant, Sector 3, ASAP. Copy that. The Autobot brothers are in that quadrant. Prowl is online. Now for his younger brother, Sideburn, he's the fastest. Now I'm scanning for x -Bron. He's the oldest and the strongest. Listen up, guys. This is a battle protocol. Now here we're introduced to the Autobot brothers. Referred to in Japan as the Car brothers. Again... Kind of like with the absence of female Transformers, there's no real explanation for the familiar terms given to these. Uh, what exactly makes them brothers? We're not told. Like I said before, you'll probably get tired of hearing, Robots in Disguise doesn't say. But the Autobot brothers are three brothers with a clear older, oldest, middle child, and youngest. Um, they're really the only... Transformers in this universe that are described as being a sort of family unit like this. There's only one other pair that are described as brothers. And um, we'll talk about that when that comes up. They do go into actually a slightly more of an explanation there, but only slightly. Uh, here, we're given no explanation. Uh, even the term Autobot Brothers largely is used to identify them as a team. Kind of like the special teams back in the 80s. The Autobots in Robots in Disguise are all grouped into teams. Other than Optimus Prime, really, and perhaps one or two others, Autobots don't operate as independent units. Uh, they are, in fact, assigned to a team, usually with a clear team leader, uh, and they will operate normally as a group. Optimus, being in command of all of the teams, does not himself strictly belong to any of them. He's just simply the Autobot Supreme Commander over all all the teams. The Autobot brothers are the first team we're introduced, and that's their team name. As, yes, each team has a name, and apparently because these three are brothers, they're known as the Autobot brothers. There's less of a clear team leader with them, perhaps because they are brothers. Um, I would say x is typically portrayed as sort of an unofficial leader, perhaps because he is the eldest. Although Prowl is um, a very much by-the-book character and will often take a sort of leadership role as well by telling the others what's the proper protocol for this situation. 
If I keep going at this rate, I think I can get to New York in time for breakfast. My apologies, huh? ma'am, but you're going to have to take a cab. Me? Why? So again, here we see the Autobot brothers are pretending to be ordinary cars. Just like Optimus Prime, they've infiltrated human society by pretending to be our vehicles. Again, this doesn't really seem very practical, and actually after a couple of episodes, it's largely dropped. Uh, because it is a very awkward premise. Uh, as near as I can tell, it really only exists to justify the title, Robots in Disguise. We also see here a sort of side character. Uh, I don't believe she's ever actually named in the series, um, but outside sources identify her as Kelly. She's not plot relevant typically. Uh, I can only really think of one or two instances where she actually has a impact on the story. And there is, in fact, as we'll talk about when we come to it, one episode where she actually has a major impact on the plot, even if sort of an accidentally and very briefly. Largely, she exists as essentially the Waspinator of the TV series. If you're not familiar with Waspinator, this character uh, comes from Beast Wars. And basically, he was the character that would get killed in every episode. Again, as I said, his spark would not be extinguished. So he was always repairable. But that was basically his gimmick, if you will. The reason being that he was both a fan favorite and hated by the producers of Beast Wars, as they found his particular speech pattern very annoying. And they had actually wanted to write him out of the show at the end of the first season. But because he was so popular with the fans, they were talked into keeping him. And so they dealt with that by essentially killing him off every episode. He very much became the butt of every joke kind of character. Kelly will kind of fill this role for robots in disguise. She's never killed, of course, being that she's a human being and not a robot. But something bad will always happen to her. Um, usually only a minor inconvenience, but kind of something enough to ruin her day. She appears in almost every episode and is basically just a running joke. It's an emergency. Oh. Sorry. Hey, that's a pretty slick little chassis you got there. <laughs> oh my. Quit fooling around, Sideburn. You got ties alert, same as I did. Now, I don't mean to keep harping on the lack of female Autobots in the story, but I do find it interesting that the Autobots seem to be aware of the concept, despite the fact that the entire cast on both the good guys and the bad guys are male. The Autobots still seem to have a concept of flirting with a member of the opposite sex, or whatever that means for robots. Uh, as this is also a running gag in the series, Sideburn will flirt, as they call it, with every little red sports car he comes across. Yes, it's just as, as annoying as it sounds. He will do this no matter how inconvenient it is at the time, and there are even entire plot points that revolve around him flirting with these non-sentient, non-robot machines. Fortunately, it is something that typically only happens in the first half or so of the series. Um, Sideburn will eventually, they seem to have gotten got, got tired of the joke. Some people describe it as Sideburn growing up, but that's not really accurate. His character does not go through any arc, and he never does actually mature. It's simply the writers eventually get tired of the same joke with him, and instead introduce even more immature characters to kind of take that role from him. I'll take that as a yes. Now find a place to hide and stay out of the way, okay? Uh, okay. Now I know this seems a little bit random that x bronze giant head is in the cabin with Koji, but um, I assume this is also a bit of an Easter egg. If you owned the x bronze toy, that is actually where his head ends up when you transform him. That's the only reason I can think of why this scene is in here. Come on, x bronze take your best shot. You must be a mind reader, friend, because that's exactly what I'm planning to do. There's a little errand I have to run first. You hang tight, we'll be right back. Hey, wait! What am I supposed to do to you? Come back! Measure your tongue or something! This is bad comedy. Now, even as a kid, I did not like this scene. Um, x runs off to do his errand 
as he tells Slapper. And Slapper says, what should I do? And Exbron tells him to measure his tongue or something. And then Slapper actually does it. This is the exact opposite of the way the characters would be treated in Beast Wars or even Beast Machines. As all the characters are treated as reasonably intelligent. Even the characters that were less intelligent were still not complete morons. Um, little quips like running an errand or something which would be typical banter. But no Predacon would simply stand around in the battlefield while his comrades were engaged with the, uh, the Maximals and just wait for the Maximal he's fighting to come back. Um, if a Maximal ran off somewhere, either Predacon would pursue him or he would team up with one of the other Predacons to take on another Maximal, or proceed on to whatever goal it is the Predacons were trying to do. Choir stasis pods, or whatever the plot was. The fact that Slapper actually sits there measuring his tongue... To, to be honest, even as a kid, I felt as if the show was insulting me. Slapper should jump in and help Darkscream or Gaskunk by attacking Prowl or Sideburn, or he should come to Megatron's aid and attack Optimus Prime. He shouldn't be standing there measuring his tongue as presumably meant to be some type of joke. I'm not laughing. 42 feet 3 inches, that's impressive! Stretch Frog, and fall! Hey, that's not fair! You tricked me! You tricked me? What exactly was the trick here? Even in the show's context, x Bron has not played a trick on Slapper. He simply got an attack from, I guess, height advantage. I'm not even necessarily sure what the advantage of this maneuver is, why he couldn't have simply shot Slapper on the street. Like I said, Beast Machines had the reputation for being the worst Transformers show ever, until this came out. And Robots in Disguise is not even the worst Transformers show, as they've done far worse than this, unfortunately. Let's see how you do against my skunk tail attack! No way you're getting through my barrier shield! Have a little fusion flame! It's amazing how a nice day can turn into such a bummer! Yes, in an anime, even blocking with a shield requires you to name it. Congratulations, Darkscream! You just won the prize for most obnoxious life form! Battery will get you nowhere, Autobots! Beast mode! I actually do kind of like that line. The Predacons, regardless of what universe they in, are always nearly unabashedly evil. And insulting them on their evil, they actually take as a positive compliment. Also, props to Darkscream for correctly using the command code Beast Mode to transform into his Beast Mode. <laughs> Oh, a scratch! That does it, Dark Scream! Now you're really gonna get it! I just washed and waxed this morning! Oh no! <laughs> now, while silly, I have to give credit where credit is due. Robots in Disguise actually does a pretty good job in this episode in giving the Autobot brothers each distinct personalities. x Braun is a uh, kind of rambunctious, off-road, kind of western cowboy type, you know, personality to him. Prowl, on the other hand, be the police car of the group, is very much protocol and serious and most actually probably machine-like of the group in his own way, whereas Sideburn is sort of the punk roadster and very narcissistic about his appearance uh, and largely concerned with himself first and foremost, although he is a heroic Autobot. Now, regardless, Robots in Disguise doesn't really do character arcs. Most characters... Um, they are exactly as they have been introduced and don't change. There are one or two exceptions of more breakout characters. We'll talk about them when we meet them. But like I said, they at least gave the Autobot Brothers three distinct personalities, and Optimus Prime as well. Uh, Megatron has his own characterization as well, if it is largely just generic uh, mustache-twirling evil. The three Predacon Stooges... Uh, as they do not really have a team name, don't really have separate characters, though. Uh, they are almost always seen in a group and pretty much are interchangeable. Uh, they don't really have distinct character traits from each other. They do have a little bit in the way of specialization, as we may, may see in future episodes, but it's so rarely used, they might as well all be the same character. <laughs> ha 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 ha! 
You seem a little rusty, Optimus. Uh, can't let him win. Got to help Koji's father. Huh? No. Koji, stay back. Megatron! Hmm? You're just a big punk, a bully. You know what? You're a loser. You insolent brat. Good job, Koji. You distracted him just long enough. Yes, if you thought Michael Bay was the first to use a human character insulting a Transformer to actually affect the plot, you would be wrong. Robots in Disguise did this first. Yes, Megatron just got distracted because Koji called him mean names. Set for Megatron target signature. Flying fist! Find it packs quite a punch. In case you're curious, no, the toy actually does not do this. But never mind about that. Time for a theme song shot. All right. Don't be a fool, Prime. We can share this planet's riches. Not a chance, Megatron. I won't let you plunder this planet and leave it a lifeless barren rock as you have with countless other worlds. I'm gonna take you down. You've already lost this battle, and you just don't know it. So here's a little bit of characterization that I like. Uh, Megatron does try to recruit Optimus Prime to his side, which does actually make sense that Megatron would try to do this, assuming that he doesn't really know Optimus Prime all that well. Again, this both suggests a little bit of history and doesn't. Uh, is this the first time Megatron's actually met Optimus one-on-one? -on -one? Has he never tried to recruit him before? He will never try to recruit him again for the rest of the series. Which, again, makes sense considering how diametrically opposed these characters are. At the same time, Optimus mentions how many worlds Megatron has left a lifeless husk, literally using the word countless. This suggests that Megatron has done this many, many times. Unfortunately, Optimus doesn't say how many of those worlds the Autobots fought against him, whether they did or didn't. Again, we don't really know about their track record. Megatron has conquered other worlds. How many times have the Autobots saved other worlds? Is this the first time? Have they saved other worlds? Have they failed to save other worlds? A mixture of both? Again, we don't know. Also note the little animation error there on one of Megatron's knees, I guess. It, you can see it's colored all purple, and in the same shot, his other knee is colored black and red, as it's supposed to be. Megatron jet mode! <laughs> Here we get introduced to Megatron's fifth mode. His flight mode, referred to as jet mode here. And he uses a command code for it that's at least not terrorized. Uh, as I said, Megatron is a six changer, but his sixth mode is actually not revealed in this episode. I don't know if that was meant to be a plot point. It's possible actually that the Autobots are not aware of how many modes Megatron has, although they don't really act in surprise when he uh, keeps changing forms. Again, he's really the only six changer in the series. Most of the other Transformers simply have two modes. And even Transformers that have an additional mode in the toy don't use it in the show. Again, whether it's because they simply couldn't think of a use for it or it was to highlight how special Megatron was having multiple forms, I'm not sure. Again, if it is the latter reason, nobody ever makes a big deal of the fact Megatron has multiple modes. I mean, does this signify he's more powerful than the typical Transformer? He and Optimus seem fairly evenly matched, and in fact, Optimus hasn't pulled out the big guns yet, uh, nor will he in this episode. And we'll talk more about that when we reach those episodes. But regardless, Megatron does not use his sixth mode in this episode and later when he does use it the Autobots do not immediately realize that it's him although he's also wearing a disguise not particularly good one though as you are easily able to tell that it is in fact Megatron but again this was actually made for a young audience so perhaps it wasn't meant to be a mystery to the children watching and that's why he's shown that it's so obvious that it's Megatron but yet the Autobots don't realize it. A wise decision Megatron. Oh yes I'll do but I'm not going alone. <laughs> Dad! Let him go you monster! Soon all his knowledge will be mine! <laughs> Now, I actually do like this part. 
a lot of times TV shows intended for even you know older uh, teens and the like will often feature the good guys winning in every single episode, every single battle. Maybe there'll be a momentarily loss, but by the end of the episode, they will have triumphed. Robots in Disguise does actually open with the Predacons winning. True, they do retreat from the battlefield, but Megatron came here for Dr. Onishi, and he leaves with Dr. Onishi. And it's not even like the good doctor is rescued in the very next episode. He actually remains Megatron's prisoner for an extended period. This does give a level of gravitas to the Predacons that's sorely lacking throughout most of the rest of the series, except for the occasional episode. But it does help Megatron, at least, to seem like he is a genuine threat. He is capable of of success, even when Optimus Prime is standing right there. Unfortunately, this is also a bit undercut by the Predacons immediately after, which I am sure is probably meant to be intentional, as this is meant to be a silly kids show, and we don't want to have the little children be too worried about the good doctor. Dad! No! Megatron's gone! What do we do now? We got what we came for! Let's get out of here! Dad's glasses. <laughs> now I want you to remember this. If you take nothing else away, if you remember nothing else, remember this. Dr. Onishi does not have his glasses. Koji, I'm sorry, my friend. I promised I would save your father, and I will. I'll never give up. Never. <laughs> but Optimus, how are you going to defeat the Predacons? They're so powerful. Our power is greater than theirs, because it comes from a place of goodness, not greed. We'll get your father back. Believe me. I do believe. Good. They're so powerful? Megatron was powerful. So the three stooges, they really didn't seem like they were that difficult to handle. Regardless, I do like Optimus Prime here. This is a, a very good uh, showing of his character, which I do appreciate. And in case you're wondering, and I know you're on the edge of your seat, yes, Koji has decided to trust Optimus Prime. So that was the first episode of Robots in Disguise. Uh, I watched this actually with my parents, who were actually both fans of Beast Wars and even Beast Machines. This is the only episode they ever watched. Uh, literally never watched another episode. As I said, coming off of Beast Wars and even Beast Machines, uh, this was definitely a drop all around in quality. Um, going from the cool CGI to the rather cheap animation the strong three-dimensional characters to the rather one-dimensional character types, and from interesting and engaging plots to the, only the most simple storylines. Yeah, I did continue to watch the series in its entirety, but um, definitely this did not live up to the legacy that is Beast Wars. Now, like I said, this series is translated from Japan, and along with, of course, just the typical issues that come with translating a foreign language with its own grammar structure and cultural context texts and phrases and other such things there are minor little changes done both visually even and uh, to the dialogue um, one of the interesting things about car robots is that its opening and closing sequences are actually slightly longer than robots in disguises Meaning that the actual episode's contents of Robots in Disguise are actually slightly longer. So this is often done by adding a little extra footage in. Uh, often this is simply done by staying on, you know, on one scene for a little bit longer or re-looping a scene uh, to extend it. Now in Japan, Car Robots aired one year earlier, 2000, than Robots in Disguise, 2001. So the celebration going on in the beginning of the episode is actually a celebration of the new millennium. Naturally, this doesn't quite work in the American version, which happens a year later. So it's just simply changed to a scientific symposium, 
Which does it make, make a little bit more sense why Dr. Onishi's involved. Um, after all, there's no particular reason to have a scientist like him speaking during a millennium celebration. Uh, other minor differences include Fire Convoy asking Koji for his name, whereas Optimus Prime already knows Koji's name. In fact, Koji even asks him about it, and Optimus Prime, surprise, doesn't explain. Also in Car Robots, Megatron apparently arrived to kidnap everybody that was on stage. Uh, whereas in Robots in Disguise, he's specifically come for Dr. Onishi. Uh, there are other minor little variations, most that aren't really that important. But just to demonstrate how Car Robots is even more dumbed down, in the scene where Expron tells Slapper that he has to run an errand, in the Japanese version, Expron actually convinces Slapper that Expron thinks skyscrapers are mountains and that he can't fight his urge to climb them. Again, remember, he's kind of an off-road, westerner-type character. This is slightly improved in Robots in Disguise by making it actually a more battle tactic, you know, with some funny banter, if you will. Granted that it's very poor, but... It's marginally more intelligent than what the car robots version of this scene was. So that was the first episode of Robots in Disguise. The real, original Robots in Disguise. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, and 5 being mediocre, I give this about a 2. Maybe a 2.5 if I was feeling generous. This episode does what it needs to be done to introduce the main characters and set up the core concept, but it's very, very boring. Uh, many people have noticed that the majority of the runtime seems to be Megatron getting closer and closer to Dr. Onishi. That pretty much sums this episode up. There's really not much else to say about it. Now for awards, I award this a B for boring, a bow for polite combat etiquette, and a waspinator for Kelly. Until next time, thanks for listening. Attack ships on fire off the shore of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark.